Hello out there in Guitar Modern Land. I've mentioned Downtown Music Gallery a number of times on the website. They are an invaluable resource for anyone looking for records by many of the modern guitarists that I cover. Um, I also use their email blast to search for new modern guitarists. I will scroll through religiously and look for names of players that I've never heard of. Um, recently, I discovered one named Patrick Higgins. I was amazed that I never heard of him because he has had a 10-year, over 10-year career with a band called The Z's as a solo guitarist playing through a laptop and also as a composer for string quartets and other modern music ensembles. I checked out his stuff on YouTube, as is my want, and I was blown away, so I decided I had to interview him. Uh, we connected and did a great interview. Uh, he was on the move using his phone while we were doing it up in Hudson, New York. Um, the sound is really good, but if you suffer from motion sickness, you may just want to listen to the audio. Otherwise, feel free to watch and enjoy. Okay. All right. We're all set. Beautiful. Well, nice to meet you, Mike. <laughs> you too. Um, it's been uh, it's been a source of wonder to me that I haven't come across your name in my wanderings before. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I wasn't involved that involved in the, I guess you might call it the new classical world. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I recently did start getting involved in that talking to, uh, James from, Jim from D Dither. Um, oh yes, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and some other people, um, up in Montreal, um, Boy, my name memory for now, Tim Brady up in Montreal, who does uh, these 200 guitar compositions um, up in Montreal. So I haven't, uh, so I've become involved in it. And the only way I discovered you was through a terrific, I'm sure you're familiar with Downtown Music Gallery. Oh, yeah, of course. Love that shop. <laughs> yeah. And they, uh, I used to go to concerts there and stuff when I was living in New York. And, and they, uh, they, posted i still get their email and every time i go through it looking for guitar players i haven't heard of that are on some record and uh they had your name wrong in the in the listing but when i looked up <laughs> looked up the i think you were Derek higgins or something yeah pretty funny but when Bruce i looked typo. <laughs> when i looked it up uh i found you and i was blown away by the live performances and the recordings and and the breadth of your career at this point. I mean, the fact that you've been all over the world, toured all over the world playing and, you know, have gotten commissions and all that kind of stuff. So um, just to start, what? how did you get started? Was guitar your first instrument? Guitar was not my first instrument, but I'd started very, very young. I, uh, I, I, I began with piano when I was probably about six years old. Um, and then I started... I started studying the guitar at nine. So what would that be? 27 years ago now. <laughs> yeah. Did you start on classical guitar? <clears throat> no, I didn't. I started playing, um, playing like rock and roll and blues as a little kid. And um, pretty young thereafter, I got, um, I got into, into punk rock music. And then very quickly, uh, like late middle school, early high school started studying jazz guitar very seriously and um so my first kind of like i guess my first sort of hybridization of like work on the instrument was a uh, kind of a balance between playing in punk and hardcore bands and playing um playing very serious jazz music i, I didn't really get into um any sort of quote unquote classical work until really i was in college yeah so you start studying classical guitar and because you're, I mean, your classical guitar technique sounds terrific on the Bach um, record. And uh, oh, thank you. So how many years have you been playing classical now? Um, God, that's a good question. Probably about uh, about sixteen years now. Wow. Yeah. And that record's yeah. what about three or four years old now? That that record's five years old now. Yeah, that came out in two thousand fifteen. Yeah, well, I want to get uh, into that, but 
First, how did how did Z's come together, the band? Mm. Yeah, Z's was Z's was started. Um, I want to say informally in about 1999 um, with uh, two two composers and saxophone players named Sam Hilmer and Alex Minchek, uh, who were at the Manhattan School of Music at that time and were studying jazz and uh, classical composition and wanted to try something much more. Um, Kind of extreme and outside of genre that applied the sort of rigors of sheet music to playing sort of club and punk and downtown music so they were i think really at that time one of the one of the earliest ensembles in in like the downtown scene that was doing really intense kind of like rigorous seemingly freeform music but that was so technically organized it was almost uh, shocking to hear and they would play off of scores. Um, so the band has been around quite a long time and it had really kind of three distinct lineups. Um, I joined the band uh, eight years ago now uh, in 2012. Um, Did they have so a guitar? It's had a, quite a long run. Yeah, the, the, the group when it first started was a kind of a double trio. It was, was two percussion, two guitar, and two tenor saxophones. Um, so it always had this kind of line of, of symmetry um, that they would play with in the in the compositions. Um, and so it has always had guitar, horn, and percussion. That's been the sort of core element of the group for 20 years. Um, what we've started doing in the past, you know, uh, eight years and much more so in the last four years is like really integrating a lot of live electronic processing into the mix. So no any no no kind of like pre-recorded backing tracks or anything but integrating a lot of live processed uh electronics into the percussion and guitar and uh and saxophone so the, the group now exi has existed as a trio for the last eight years but in a way a sort of a trio plus uh the electronics in a way work to kind of double and disfigure and distend the, the group into farther <laughs> reaches Right, yeah, I checked out some of the videos with you playing, and I I could hear some of that. Although the most recent ones seem to be almost five years old now, the most recent video records of it. But um, but I was curious how much of the music is improvised. I could see people reading, and some of it is obviously you know composed. But mm -hmm. uh, is any like at times it seems like the saxophone goes off into some sort of improvisation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. The, um... You know, the, the, the work with Z's has been um, very much dealing with like a kind of a legacy of through composed music. And uh, certainly on the, the record we put out in 2015 called Z, XE, that was all um, very much like through composed long form pieces. But even in the way we do composition, it's always, uh, especially now, it kind of inbuilds a lot of room for uh, st structured like you know group group dynamic improvising um we did a live record two years ago um called nuff that we recorded live at cafe auto in london that was uh completely improvised which i think was actually the first first fully improvised z's record in you know the 20-year history of the band so we've been doing quite a lot of free improvising in the last few years um that we've been touring and that's been really interesting coming from you know, the experience of, of a band and ensemble that is like primarily really rigorous, hyper memorized, long form writing to uh, sort of using that as a as a kind of group language starting point to to improvise is has been really fascinating because it's it's free improvisation to some extent, but it's also within a very specific ensemble language that we've developed over many years. So it works almost in a funny way more like live composition than it than it does like free improvisation in a more uh, traditional sense you know sure well i mean for my money live improv i mean free improvisation should always be a form of of live composition anyway of some sort absolutely you know? absolutely uh, yes <laughs> but but do you mean by language do you mean you still kind of adhere to the minimalist um uh groove that the composition seem to inhabit less 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 so that and more i guess a uh, a language of how to communicate between ourselves in in the way that we're we're making decisions and making turns in the moment so um i guess more something like uh, almost preternatural or 
telekinetic in the way you can develop with musicians you've just played with hundreds of times over many years, you know. So more, I suppose, a kind of subtle communicative language between the elements of the band um, rather than some kind of like specific genre of commitment, really. Um, like the Nuth record, the, the Cafe Auto live record um, is actually quite, quite maximalist and, and extreme and has very little groove on the whole on the whole set um and yet i think still pretty clearly registers as a as a z's record so it's, it's kind of interesting well so is your guitar playing in that context closer to what you're doing in your solo shows um yes yeah yeah it's much it's much closer to the kind of work um like on the, the record dossier that i put out um two years ago on other people that is, I, I, I'm ashamed to say I just started listening to it before we started talking because I was busy listening to the older stuff. And <laughs> also, um, you know, and I saw you do the dossier. I did see the dossier video, mm. um, but the record sounds just amazing. And I want to get into that. Um, but in your solo music, I'm trying to f figure out what exactly are you doing? I mean, could you go through kind of your setup and how you're, you know, are you playing through a laptop? How are you triggering things? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you mean for uh, for the solo guitar works? Yeah, yeah. So my my setup there is kind of like a is a is a very unique rig that I, I spent many years kind of like honing and, and developing mostly live, like on on tour with uh, <clears throat> with Z's for many years, and then doing many solo tours for a number of years before I began really like writing and developing that material. But the the rig is basically like um, a kind of three-part analog chain that, that breaks out into one stereo signal and one mono signal. Um, the stereo signal goes through a kind of a panning delay um, that is uh, separated by a volume fader with my foot um, from the mono line, which goes through more like a signal processing chain. And then I have a, a series of like MIDI hex pickups on the guitar um, that I use to communicate with the laptop, which also sends out a stereo signal. So the live guitar set is really five channels of audio um, that are that are live mixed. Um, so I use the laptop again, also not really for backing tracks, but to um, to map uh, discrete samples onto individual frets uh, on the neck. And um, I'm able then to use the left hand um, to to basically trigger uh, an array of samples that are each mapped onto individual notes. So I'm like kind of simultaneously playing the laptop as well as the three different channels of guitar output. So, so there's actual guitar signal being blended in with the laptop. Uh... Yeah, there's a there's a lot of guitar signal. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, that that must be fairly processed as well. What are you processing it through? Um, well, um, you know, it's 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 simpler than it seems. I um, of course use a good amount of pedals, but uh, I've I've always preferred much more to rely on a a kind of specific technique of playing than on a really heavy array of processing. So I use relatively simple stuff. I have like a, a, a DD7 delay pedal, for instance, and a little pitch shifter and a volume pedal, uh, occasionally a little Moog, um, you know, kind of VCO synth that the guitar runs through. Um, but I play with a metal pick, for instance, which um, really changes the attack and kind of overtone characteristics of the contact with the string. and of course, do a lot of um, finger tapped and sort of slapped work with the right hand um, to get very non-guitaristic sounds. I mean, one thing I've really been interested in my whole life, but certainly my whole career as like a performing guitarist, uh, is to do the sort of least guitaristic things possible with the with the with the instrument. Um, so I've always been interested in. Um, yeah, performing music in which the, the instrumental source is a bit hidden or occluded, um, or at least transcended in some uh, technical or uh, or signal processing way, where it's less like obvious what sort of instrument you're listening to, and instead maybe just uh, hearing music without an immediate grasp of what the instrument is. Uh, and that's always been really fascinating to me. 
Well, you've succeeded um, in, in, you know, in obscuring most of the guitar sounds as, as, uh, as specific guitar sounds. And are, what, what are you using to um, hold your samples in the laptop? And... Yeah, I have a, um, a sort of a custom built piece of software that um, allows me to um, basically read the MIDI data that is coming off of that pickup. Um, and set up sample arrays where, like, uh, each individual chromatic pitch on a given string would uh, output a MIDI control value, and then I can uh, assign that control value to play back a sample according to, uh, like, velocity and volume and duration and so on. Um, but it's a custom it's a custom piece of programming. Um, and then I also have the, the MIDI pickup on the guitar. It also communicates with, um, with Reactor, which is, like, a, a soft synth. Uh, sure. that Native Instruments makes. Um, so I use it as well to control like uh, synthesizer patches that create these kind of large pad beds uh, that are also kind of live, manipulated and modulated by the uh, MIDI control values coming out of the guitar string. Uh, is the sampler, is that created in Max or using Max or... Yeah, um, in, in Max MSP, and, and part of the patch was written in, in Pure Data, which is a very similar kind of language. Yeah. Do they talk to each other? I know people who use, you know, each, but I don't. I don't know that many people use both. I, in a live context, I use I use Max MSP. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But the uh, the Pure Data you use uh, for recording. It's just just for uh, the kind of the kind of first versions of the of the triggering patch. I was I was exploring that, but um, yeah, I'm using using Max MSP for the last number of years now with it. Yeah. Do you find it's more stable? Uh, I do. I find it's more stable, and I find it's a little bit uh, <laughs> it's a little bit less difficult to make changes, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little more user friendly. So are you going through an amp or amps, or are you going uh, into a mixer, into uh, live, and I mean, into the PA? Yeah, I, so I actually I actually stopped using amps uh, altogether in my live performance, like uh, maybe about seven years ago now, eight years ago. Um, so I tour with like a large mixer, and um, I go right into the house sound systems. So I also really enjoy that because, again, it sort of gives you as much less guitar centric sound uh, and it's much more in a way like sound system music so i also do a lot that plays with like the kind of full frequency spectra um in that so i really like the different kinds of punch and attack that you can get from the mid-range drivers and tweeters and a big pa as well as of course uh all the big subs <laughs> but yeah i always go straight into the house <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I, that's 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 a theme amongst a lot of laptop players and and it goes kind of uh, goes back i go back and forth i mean i i, I yeah. certainly understand the the um the appeal of you know when you start using certain filters and things some of the low end is you know does not make guitar amps happy um but uh <laughs> But then you get a certain thing out of guitar amps that's a different thing also that if, you know, if you're oh, into God, that yeah. sound. Um, Absolutely. So, like, go, moving up to the Bach for Bacchanalia um, record, what yeah. what made you feel you wanted to process Bach? Yeah, I was really interested in uh, trying, trying something new with, of course, uh, some of my goes without saying some of my favorite music ever written of course but uh but music that's been so um so often recorded and interpreted many 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 times over i felt um that there was both an interesting challenge and a potentially new horizon for uh reframing very familiar pieces by engaging them electronically as well but i liked that a lot because i would do it uh I would do it live, so the processing wasn't done after the fact. Uh, it's done actually like during the performance, which changes the way that you, in a in a very real way, changes the way that you're kind of like hearing and feeling the, the counterpoint and the rhythm and the harmony um, as you go. So to me, it was also like a really interesting way to uh, find new angles of interpretation into the pieces, uh, also to like liberate a certain passing tones that might be 
especially beautiful, but maybe very brief when played in like traditional staccato counterpoint. Uh, so also to be able to like sustain elements of, of dissonance or interesting suspended harmonies and uh, to play with uh, the rhythm in the work in a, in a really bizarre way. Uh, I found that to be kind of the most exciting part of the electronics in that project. So were you miking the guitar and then um, using outboard gear to process and then having that fed back into your monitor? Yes, exactly. I used a little um, a little copper-plated uh, Fishman pickup that I would in installed inside of the classical guitar, so it basically picks up the resonance from the you know kind of top of the soundboard, as it were. Um, and then so that would be fed into a laptop on an analog pedal chain. Um, and then, of course, we would set up a bunch of just acoustic mics in the room and get a nice blend of acoustic sound and room tone as well. Yeah, because the acoustic sound is beautiful on the, the record as well. Um, Thank you. So what made you decide to not process some of the tunes? on? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, variety was one important uh, point. I also didn't really want it to be a kind of a kitsch engagement with that work. You know, I think like... Um, it was definitely it's a it's a, a set of compositions I of course like take very seriously and, and very reverently but um, so there was that element and then especially with the piece the Chacon from the second violin partita in D minor which uh, basically closes out that record but that's the very long 14 minute piece um, that one to me was a bit too sacred to process uh, <laughs> so I really wanted to just play that one <laughs> But I did, I think, still achieve a very unique version of that in that recording uh, through a much more aggressive miking uh, setup of the um, the transients in the room and the and the reverb characteristic of the church. So, so w was that the same thought process that went into the uh, Everly music? Um, or I'm pronouncing it Everly music, but it looks like you just replaced the U's with uh, with uh, V's or. Uh, yeah, early, early music. Yeah. Early music, yeah. <laughs> we just inverted the A's, <laughs> flipped them around. Yeah, early music. Yeah, absolutely. That was um, that was a duo record with a great violinist named Josh Modney, um, whom I work with a lot in, um, in in my like classical composition. But we've done a lot of duo improvising together over the years and uh, performed a lot of concerts together. So when we made that, uh, which we actually usually do with electric guitar and heavily processed violin. So when we decided to make the record, we uh, sort of at the last minute had the idea to do two thirds of the record completely acoustic and only do electroacoustic stuff for the kind of final suite or partita on the album. Um, but yeah, similarly there, we were really interested in using the kind of elements of like extended technique and noise performance on the instruments to create more melodic contour and the more traditionally melodic lines to create uh, disruptive elements. So it was uh, also, I suppose, a kind of attempt to um, process, as it were, um, what the violin and guitar can do acoustically, um, but just with just with performance technique uh, rather than electronic. Yeah, well, it's a really interesting record. Um, how does the guitar figure in your composing for other instruments, like the for string quartet on your uh, on the new release Toxin? Yeah, um, to be fair, it, 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 I, it does not figure almost at all. <laughs> I do most of that writing um, almost entirely um, on paper and um, just in in my head, uh, and occasionally with the, with the piano. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, I. I definitely hear a a similarity in that music in terms of tension and release and things like that mm. that I hear in your solo guitar performances. So I guess there's a musical sensibility that that translates even though it's not guitar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think to to me that also kind of speaks to um, you know, a point I was making a little earlier about um you know, my whole relationship to making music with with and for the guitar has, um, in my way, always been about uh, aspiring to something musical rather than something guitaristic. And so I think in, in that respect, uh, it's it's a, it's a similar kind of thought, even with writing for string quartet or a piano trio or a chamber orchestra. It's it's more that uh, I'm chasing a musical idea rather than a kind of formal principle that the 
uh, ensemble setup would dictate, you know? Yeah, well, I find once uh, that makes sense because once you once you remove guitar cliches and guitar standard guitar tone, you know, because I mean I do similar things in terms of using the guitar as a sound. Once you use the guitar purely as a sound generating instrument, then mm-hmm. then it becomes all about making music of some sort out of that sound, yeah. as opposed to you know blues licks or jazz licks or or right. or things like that. Um, Guitarist. Yeah, things. absolutely. But oh, I've asked other people this. Do you do you find something special about using the guitar as a sound generating instrument as opposed to using a synthesizer or something like that? Hmm. I do absolutely. I think. Uh, I mean, I suppose the, the the most the most obvious answer, but in a way uh, non trivial, is that it's just the it's the instrument I'm good at playing and <laughs> the one I've spent the longest um, developing a, a good technique on. But uh, I do, of course, think there's something very different. I guess it's the uh, I don't know the 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 classical guitarist Julian Bream has a really beautiful phrase about this where he says the the guitar is is the management of six little depths. Um, <laughs> and I I love that because yeah. it's it's only a six voiced instrument of course and it has very little sustain really, so we can use a lot of electronics and special effects as it were to make it a sustaining instrument. But really, it's an instrument that doesn't last very long as it were. Um, it's uh, it's kind of there and then it's fading immediately. And I think we're always kind of struggling with uh, um, the desire to make it last longer or become richer somehow. And uh, I like that metaphor very much. And I think there's, there is something peculiar to the guitar in that that I, I find very poetic, but, but also uh, productive. Well, you, that's interesting because, I mean, that's, it's absolutely true, but... Practically, I mean, since the invention of the electric guitar, guitarists have been working on, you know, myriad ways to extend that decay, whether it's yeah. distortion <laughs> or um, or ebos or uh, mm-hmm. or the uh, what's the uh, the gizmatron, um, and of course with the synth guitar, you can, you know, you can turn mm-hmm. it practically into a synth. So. I, I guess the mm-hmm. question I would have is: is do do you make use of that quick decay as part of you know your making music process? I, I do absolutely, and, and for me, that's like where the um, that's where the percussive element comes in in a, in a very profound way. So, like I, I'm I'm really interested in also uh, using the guitar to like instance really interesting types of uh, polyrhythmic and kind of poly um percussive effects and, and percussive environments. And I think that the, certainly like the tension in the strings is a big part of that, the physical tension. They're, they're, uh, they're very, they're very bouncy. They're very reactive. They're, uh, <laughs> um, and of course the, like the blend of, you know, really short lived punching, cascading percussive uh, attacks on a guitar string coupled with uh, the ways in which different sorts of like resonances and synth patches can sustain and, and evolve creates like a very, uh, very compelling pastiche for me. And uh, yeah, I think that was also like a big part of the, the design and playing on the, on the dossier material for sure. That's interesting, yeah, because I do. That's the next thing I want to discuss is that record. But you do beat that guitar like a drum uh, quite a bit while yeah. you're, while you're performing, and there's a, definitely yeah. that rhythmic aspect. So, how was Dossier recorded? That was recorded um, in in, a, in studio, but live in one take. Um, so I want I really wanted that to be a performance document of those four pieces. Then they're really composed as a suite, as a as a through performance. So. Um, that was material I had I had composed over about three years of solo touring of that material before it was named. But when I would do solo concerts or solo tours, I was developing that set of works. Um, and then when it came time to record it, um, it's fully a studio record. But I uh, I wanted to execute it um, with the with the momentum and impetus that doing a straight performance 
gives you. I also found that to be a kind of philosophically uh, interesting component of the statement on the album, which is, of course, on the one hand, is very much an electronics record, but um, it's performed. Uh, there's no overdubs. There's no editing. Uh, there's no start or stop. It's it's just a it's a it's really a live performance from from top to bottom on that album. So I was also really kind of interested in showing the ways that um, electronic music is is more than just programming in one way that uh, that it's also very much like part of a kind of mm, tradition of instrumental practice uh, at least in the way I see it <laughs> well I mean you know the humanization of electronic music has been uh, has been a big issue for years I mean you know I, when I yeah. first got into it I remember going to see yeah. um, who did I see? Uh, he's a drummer also. I can't remember. Odeker or somebody like that at, mm. at, at the Bowery Ballroom. And, and it was the classic. He could have been reading his email. Up there, right. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, which is not to say you can't make very humanistic music. And I've seen DJs do it and, you know, and, and electronic musicians make very human sounding music. I mean, you know, totally. Fenez is not exactly a ball of fire up up on stage, but mm. but you know mm. the fact that he plays guitar and you you see the connection between him hitting the guitar and hearing the music makes a big difference. What I'm still trying to yeah. wrap my head around. Well, uh, yeah. Do you have some um, feelings about that? I, I do absolutely. I mean, I think that one one thing I um, that kind of made me feel like I was on, on the right track to some extent in first developing that material was like a lot of the reactions I would get from audiences or talking to people after, after a number of shows developing that material was like people being really um, engaged in watching it and sort of fascinated and confused by what it was they were seeing versus what it was they were hearing. Um, and that, as soon as I started getting those reactions, I felt like, okay, this is like working, you know. <laughs> um, I guess also, in other words, it's like creating a kind of interesting cognitive dissonance between um, w watching somebody do something on a guitar, which is a very familiar instrument, and having uh, the experience of being pummeled by audio that seems completely impossible to place on that instrument. Um, but seeing that live is very uh, compelling and interesting and and confusing and has a very, I think, beautiful but subtle physical component um, that I really like, you know. And um, I think that certainly for me as like a, a performance practice, you know, that's also something I'm really interested in because I think it helps to even change people's thoughts a little bit about what uh, what's possible to do with a familiar instrument, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I like that very much. <laughs> Yeah, it, that's something I've been grappling with, you know, seeing more and more electronic performers like yourself and being one is that that, mm. you know, the disconnect between what people are seeing and what you're hearing is um, it can be really interesting. I mean, watching your live performances, it's mm. it's, you know, wondering where those glitchy sounds are coming from and wondering where <laughs> those pitch swoops are coming from and. Are are you are you manipulating um, expression pedals on the floor in addition? No, I don't. I don't use any expression pedals at all. Just a, a really really simple uh, Ernie Ball volume pedal that mm -hmm. just controls the level of signal that's going into uh, two parts of the analog rig. So a lot of the a lot of the kind of glitch stuff is um, really like a particular. Uh, playing technique a lot of um almost like a kind of pinch harmonic or like a false harmonic with the right hand right. um uh, sweeped with the side of the pick against like really specific parts of the string near the bridge and uh, a kind of really deadened fast left hand technique that's very close to harmonic nodes but not quite on them um and so there's like um there's a lot in that material in other words too that is actually much more real guitar than they would realize <laughs> a lot of it seems like it's it's totally triggered which of course there is a lot of triggering but there's also a lot of just really freaky playing <laughs> as well well yeah i mean i hope someday to get to see it in person and and try and parse that um the other thing i'm trying to get my head around is 
that those are composed pieces that, you know, that so yeah. which would mean to me that you are actually playing them the same way time after time. Is that a, the fact? That is um, that is that is a fact uh, with with like an important productive caveat. But yes, they are. Uh, sure. Oh, Let me good. just start the recordings again. Um, Sorry. So I don't know if you were talking uh, for a yeah. while after <laughs> you died or where we left it off exactly. Um, but mm. um, yeah, we were saying we're, we're, uh, because they are uh, composed, you were wondering uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Just to, to discuss that, like whether they're kind of the same every time and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say to that is. Um, yeah, importantly, no. Um, they are very much written pieces, and to that extent, I think if you were to like, see, let's say, hypothetically, come watch the watch the set played ten times back to back, uh, it would very much feel like the same set, but there would be um, quite a lot of important differences too each time. So, part of the way that that music is written is that it's really um, kind of a series of like composed terrains, as it were, that have um, very discrete materials and uh, kind of discrete rules and shapes and um, thematic contents and kind of pitch registers. But um, within that, it's not through composed to the extent that I'm like uh, in bar 37 of the second movement on the third offbeat of the bar, there is this particular pinch harmonic you have to hit at this time, right? It's, so it's not um, composed in that respect, but it's composed in the respect that um, it is a very cohesive and uh, re-performable piece of music, but uh, it's performed in such a way and written in such a way that it um, allows itself to also be realized in a very kind of extemporaneous and improvisatory way while still retaining like a very, um, very clear identity. So in other words, I think you could see the same set performed six months apart and say like, oh yeah, that, that, that set. But uh, it would probably feel and register a lot of important differences too, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it does. I mean, it, it's the nature of, uh, as I'm beginning to understand of a lot of modern composition is that it, it can include, you know, it, it can include room for improvisation or for variations, mm -hmm. but, you know, there are, it's definitely there are guidances definitely if you were to give this right. to someone else to perform assuming mm -hmm. they had you know your technical ability in the same software theoretically they could you know reproduce something that sounded vaguely like what you did i mean just for starters listening to the record yeah. this morning sounded a little mm -hmm. different than watching the video of you performing it you yeah know? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, the video was, was shot at an old Fiat factory in Turin, Italy. Um, and we also just recorded a lot of room sound for that performance. So um, there's a good bit of room tone and a nice bit of kind of reverb decay going there. When I did the studio version of the record, I really, really, really worked hard to get the audio to be completely anechoic. So it was done uh, totally straight into a large analog recording console. So there's absolutely no room tone. So I wanted it to be almost like you were entering a completely sealed kind of worldless uh, acoustic environment in the experience of listening to the record. It would be almost like you're just totally sealed in this kind of non-space space. space. <laughs> well, um, it's interesting because that um, it has that it, what that the, the effect that I heard was that it gives it this amazing directness. You know, that, I mean, when you start yeah. taking ambience away it becomes right in your face. But yeah. at the same time, it doesn't sound sterile. It sounds very rich and sounds very mm -hmm. kind of analog, for want of a better yeah. word, even though you're using yeah. so much digital stuff. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And and to, to that end, from a production standpoint, it really is an analog record. I mean, that was, um, of, of course, there's all kinds of digital stuff in my chain, but the, the recording itself was, was direct into an old Helios console from the 70s through, you know, analog EQs and inductor coils and the whole nine. So it's it's very much um, electrical <laughs> as opposed to electronic, uh, if, if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, certainly 
certainly that's something I, I'm, I'm really I'm really proud of in the way that that record came together. But I think that the way of that, the way that it was written to me was very exciting and, and unique, at least for me, in, in the respect that it was really written live over many, many concerts. So it's not um, a kind of set of, of materials where I, I sat and wrote it on paper and learned it and then refined it. It was really a music that um, originated from the stage and was, was changed and developed and kind of perfected over, you know, 100 plus concerts over a few years. So it also really comes from a kind of live performance practice. The, the, the writing and execution, in other words, are simultaneous. Um, and that um, made it also a really fun record to record. I think that also made it possible to record you know, whatever, a 46 minute straight push of very difficult material um, in a single take, because it was like the, the composition itself is is that performance. And uh, it was very much sort of like in in the body by the time that was ready to be recorded, you know. Well, yeah, that always helps if you're going into the studio. Um, did you <laughs> did you record your live performances over those hundred plus live performances and and listen to them and kind of uh, edit it from there. Think think about you know what works for you and what worked on each section. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there was there was very little. I would say like um, uh, actual editing in, in with respect to like I, I wouldn't go through and parse out different parts of recordings and patch them together. But there was definitely a lot of like ref reflection and kind of like lived lived refinement, mm -hmm. lived editing as the work was developing, um, getting a sense. Really, especially for how to like achieve the the transitions uh, between the different m movements of the piece, and and also uh, really getting the the length dialed in and the various um, shifts in density and intensity. So that you know can can go off the rails very easily. And and I think also what I what I felt very happy with that that material was was really getting its its length to the right. Spot right point uh on getting the kinds of rates at which it accelerates into really intense overwhelming dense kind of noise characteristics and when it gets really open and placid and delicate um so this the subtlety there for me was really balancing the um questions of like duration and density um more than anything but that definitely just took doing it live a lot and seeing um, when is this really hitting and, and keeping people engaged and when is it too brief? When is it too long and uh, can very easily kind of space out? Um, I think if stuff like that can get too long very easily. So I felt happy with that because it does feel um, it does it does feel large and monumental to an extent, but it's um, it feels at least to me like it was the right length. <laughs> Well, that's fascinating to me uh, on a number of levels. One, I mean, it's you're you're that you do. One thing I like about your music is that it it's your your sense of tension and release, or as a friend of mine used to say, the squeezing and the letting go. But yeah. but there's also um, the fact that you hone that by audience reaction is something that I think is perhaps very unusual in the world of avant-garde and, you know, and modern classical music that, I mean, yeah. it, it seems more the, that, that interaction with the audience and sense of, you know, what works it's, you know, it, it seems most people would just compose what they compose and, you know, the audience can take it or leave it. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, what, where does that come from? And in, in, do you think in your background, uh, does that come from, you think that comes from your punk rock background and your, you know, p more pop music background? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess so. I think it probably to me is an element of like there, there needing to be, um, both something of course, like very uncompromising that you have to be committed to in, in, creating and performing like confrontational or difficult music. But I think that also when it works its best, it also needs to be very generous, which is to say like, you're not at a concert to like give people homework or to punish them, you know, uh, <laughs> even if, even if what you're doing is fucking intense and gnarly, uh, I, I'm interested in like how that can be generous. And that is to say, uh, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta engage with like what, what's working and what's effective. Um, 
not in a not in a pop way, not in a commercial way, but in the sense of uh, creating creating something effective, creating a, an environment musically in which uh, you're able to get across very novel and complex and intense ideas to people who may or may not be immediately receptive to that. And I think there's like a really important element of uh, of kind of generosity in that. There's sort of like a a fusion of horizons almost between what you're projecting and what uh, what is being received. And I'm also really interested in kind of navigating that horizon. And to me, that's very much a a gift of, of, of performance practice, you know. Um, and even with my like really more classical chamber compositions, um, although they are very different from the dossier project in, in a lot of ways, like they are full just written notated scores, um, those pieces I allowed to change and refine quite a lot over the course of, of hearing them performed by the ensembles and of working with the musicians in rehearsals um, and not, in other words, being too sacrosanct about uh, abstract uh, decisions I might have, have made in a score six months earlier and saying like, no, this is what it must be. Um, and hearing instead, well, of course, musicians other than you have to execute these works for those pieces to exist, right? So there's also a kind of giving over uh, that has to occur, I think, for those to be successful. Um, and so also, even in that way, on the on the Toxin record, there is, uh, to a lesser extent, but to an important degree, there is this kind of element of, uh, I think, a shared uh, allowance for change and refinement through performance and um I don't know. I think I think ultimately that um, that's really profound, and that at least for for me it yields the the most satisfying outcomes. You know. <laughs> well, in the end, you're trying to communicate. I mean, theoretically, yeah. you know, if you're going and putting totally. whatever you do in front of people, you're trying to communicate. One reason yeah. I think your music communicates to me. And some of the, my favorite music communicates to me and some of my favorite what people would call a little more difficult music is something mm. I call internal logic. You know, I yeah. mean, I think what right. makes the fact that Thelonious Monk works and Wayne Shorter's compositions work, mm. even though they don't follow what anybody else has ever done before, is because their yeah. internal logic is so strong that you go along with it, you know, and yeah. and it communicates. And I think your stuff does that as well. I mean, speaking of composition, though, and in general, what, you know, learning about you um, and reading about you, I was also amazed. I, I'm curious, how did you build um, the career that you seem to have in terms of co composing for all these people and touring all over the world, playing and, and uh, you know, in, in what we both agree is, you know, challenging, a challenging venue? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Well, mm. <laughs> that's, it's a good question, man. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think for me, it was, um, it was really about, uh, bu building, building a, building a community of shared practice and, and around me. And, and that is to say, uh, also of course, participating in a much larger community of practice that, importantly precedes me and precedes all of us and, and always will. But I guess in that respect, I'm very, um, very much tied to uh, a, a few different scenes uh, throughout my life. And I think that those were the things that gave, the gave, that gave me the avenues and the insights for how to, to how to build a non-traditional career in music. So coming from like the DIY culture of, um, starting your own punk band at 14 and playing shows for 20 people for no money and touring around the country in a, in a van in 2006 and playing improvised music and sleeping on floors and uh, playing downtown clubs in New York City and slowly, slowly amassing more, um, more kind of ability and prowess and focus and direction in your own work and uh, building a little bit of a following and then um, as things begin to work, you, you begin to branch out and get opportunities to do bigger stuff and bigger shows, but it all to me kind of shares in, still shares in a kind of do it yourself, uh, ethos, even, 
if I am doing a large commission for like a fancy festival in Europe or playing in a basement still uh, for a few people, um, it feels to me almost like the same thing still, that it's sort of like uh, if you want to do <laughs> music like this in public, you have to be willing to do it for five people just as much as 6,000 people. Uh, and if you can't really do either of those ones, you know, you, you're probably not going to do any of those ones. So <laughs> I kind of feel that. You know? Well, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, the the performance, you know, your solo guitar performance thing, I mean, I've, I think that that world has kind of built up. I mean, I've watched it. When I moved to Nashville, I thought well, I, I had to give that up, you know. I mean, mm. you know, in New York, I used to go to these Warburg parties, this T-shirt I'm wearing, you know. and, oh, and cool. <laughs> there, I don't know if you know those, those shows in New York where um, – you know, it's a lot of people playing through laptops and using laptops. Mm. Um, and I thought I'm going to move to Nashville and there's going to be none of that. But there apparently mm. was a guy down here promoting those shows. And apparently there's a circuit, um, you know, between Nashville, awesome. Knoxville and Chattanooga. So, you know, that's one thing. I mean, that circuit has started to build up more. I think maybe you found that as well. And, you know, in the States and in Europe, there's more of yeah. a market for that. But the the composition thing is a whole other world. I mean, the, the yeah, it really, it really is. Did yeah. you did I you mean, go to Manhattan School of Music? Did you go to music school for that? No, I, I didn't. I um I went to Columbia University. I studied uh, philosophy and did a did a graduate degree there in comparative literature. So very much not <laughs> conservatory. <laughs> but um, I was doing uh music in a very serious way the whole time. I, I, I just was sort of not interested in doing a conservatory degree. I have a, a huge amount of respect and reverence for uh, for that. I, I didn't really want to do it personally, but that said, I uh, did a hell of a lot of work to learn and, and master that. It's, it's extremely hard and intimidating shit, for sure. And when I was like, you know, really first kind of getting into that and wanting to do it, um, you know, I realized very quickly that there is a hell of a difficult skill set and a, and a real uh, technical and intellectual mountain to climb to even to even get in the ring. Um, but I found that really, really, really exciting. And I, I sort of took it on myself to learn it and study it and really go spend many, many, many years uh, studying notation and studying scores and boning up on music theory. I mean, of course, I had been trained in technical music, so I could read music very well. But um, learning how to compose, quote unquote, like traditional concert music is uh, is a whole other thing. And that um, I suppose I just really, really, really loved learning it. And I really loved learning it on my own. And I got very fortunate to have um, relationships early on with um, composition mentors in New York City, especially, who were uh, and are uh, amazing artists and helped me quite a lot um, when I was really getting started with that. And I think to me, that was also um, a kind of model historically, when I started learning more about that world that seemed consistent across a lot of the composers that I really liked the most, um, especially in the world of, you know, kind of high art classical music. There was a surprising number of people who really worked almost with like the apprentice model as opposed to the conservatory model. So um, <clears throat> a sort of a combination of uh, innate musical talent, but also uh, humbling yourself before this great body of knowledge that you have to uh, struggle through and, and master, but doing so in a way where you're not being uh, dominated or kind of produced by an academy, um, but rather finding your own way. But I think that if one does that very seriously and, and with a lot of joy, uh, at least for me, I, I, I felt that uh, I was able to like learn and, and, and master the things that I, that I needed to. And um, I really enjoyed that, you know. Yeah. Who were some of your mentors in, in doing that? Yeah. Well, there was uh, this guy named Eric Wubbles in, uh, in particular, who's an uh, amazing pianist and composer. Uh, he's part of the, a group called the Wet Ink Ensemble, uh, who 
performs uh, the piece called Empty Set on the Toxin record. So Wet Ink is, a, is now a 20-year long-standing um, a chamber orchestra and chamber ensemble in New York City that was actually founded by the two same guys who founded Z's. So initially, uh, Wet Ink was set up as the kind of um, classical vehicle and Z's was the kind of punk vehicle for a similar vision. And they were kind of two parallel ensembles. Um, but now Wet Ink has grown into a very, um, in my view, at least a very important uh, composer collective and a very uh, inspiring technical ensemble. They're just incredible musicians. Um, and then, of course, building a lot of relationships with young, but accomplished, but young classical performers around the time I was starting to learn that material in a way helped uh, even more well, certainly just as much as, if not even more than working with other composers who knew more than me, because uh, as soon as you start writing, some of the earliest mistakes and challenges you run up against is uh, even developing a great idea and then giving it to somebody to play and they looking at you and saying, well, <laughs> I don't think I can play this. I don't think anybody could play this. And you're like, oh, fuck, okay, what, what, have, what have I done? How do I, how do I, how do I, how do I get to where I need to get? And a lot of that, for me, learning that really came from working with the players. Um, what, what does it mean to write for a violin as opposed to a viola, as opposed to a cello or an oboe? I mean, they have such uh, obviously different characteristics, but certainly from the standpoint of technical notation and sheet music composition, there's so much to learn about all these instruments, especially if you want to write for them in innovative ways. Uh, you can't just kind of put down <laughs> your freaky idea and expect to that even a even a master oboist would be able to play it. So um, in that respect, I, I think that most composers are probably more indebted to musicians than they are to compositional study. And um, I certainly feel that for me. <laughs> well, do you think living, I mean, I assume you've been living in New York for a while now. Do you think living in New York where there is that crossover? I mean, there are all those new musicians coming out of the mm -hmm. music schools and and you know and there and there's a whole trend in among them to start playing in clubs as opposed to being part of the symphony yeah. thing you know and there's this, absolutely seems there's a big crossover between you know avant-garde performance artists and and uh modern classical players yeah there really is and i think more so much more so now in a really exciting way even than when i was first starting to really try to take uh, that side of a composition practice seriously. I mean, of course, there'd been traditions of that kind of thing, I think, in, in Manhattan, going back probably to the 60s and 70s to, to a large extent with the kind of downtown loft minimalist scene and that's crossover into chamber music and so on. But I think definitely in the last five years, that's blossomed even more. And um, <clears throat> certainly for me, I don't think I could have been half the musician or half the composer I am if I weren't in New York. I think that the, the, the and again, that's sort of what I was saying with this idea of like a community of practice around you. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so like the, the level of players and the level of musicians and the kind of, <clears throat> especially for me when I was a lot younger, the kind of level of intimidation and awe that you would feel in going to uh, a show at the at the stone or the old knitting factory or even lincoln center and you were like fuck like what are what are these cats up to how are they how are they doing this this is the, this is the shit you know and um wanting that and wanting to get in it and wanting to understand it it was you know i think not without having that around you uh um certainly it's more than possible but at least for me that was a huge part of uh you know being able to to get into this stuff and um yeah, I think New York is a very, 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 very special place in that respect because it's also, I think, always been a city that <clears throat> has these really deep intersections between uh, high and low, in quotes. But I think that's probably always been true, you know, um, of that city. And that's something I love about it, you know. And uh, it's also the city I, I, was, I was born in. So, it's you know, it's been my home. <laughs> my whole life. <laughs> right. It's true. I mean, I'm reading this Bernice Abbott uh, biography. She was a photographer um, in the twenties and thirties. And, you know, it's, it seems like everybody knew everybody in New York, yeah. you know, high and low. 
Um, so tell me yeah. about Future Past Studios. What's that about? Yeah, in uh, in in 2013, I um, uh, I took over a, a church in upstate New York that had been run as a recording studio for a while, and the former owner was uh, retiring, and so I set up a recording studio practice here that was sort of focused on uh, experimental music and new classical work and uh, a lot of like pop and rock and roll stuff as well. And yeah, it's been running for uh, over seven years now and made a made a heck of a lot of fun records up here. And um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun and challenging run. <laughs> where upstate where upstate are you? In Hudson, New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, we thought yeah. about Hudson before we moved to Nashville. Uh, we we, oh, cool. we we went went there, and I did a gig up there once, and then we went and visited. Uh, and yeah, there used to be a um, a theater there when we went up there that hadn't been renovated yet, but was just yeah. had all this red paint on the inside, and I just yeah. got some amazing photographs in there, and it was just beautiful along the water, and and uh, awesome. And I, 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 I understand that the area has built up significantly in the last couple of years in terms of influx of people. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really lifted off. I mean, I think for for good and for ill, like uh, uh, that's always a double edged blade with, with those sorts of things. Right. But I think a lot even in the seven years I've been here, I've seen enormous change. And in a lot of ways, it kind of mirrors a lot of the changes I, I saw in, in Manhattan as I was as I was leaving. And, you know, of course, I, I still have always been continued to be rooted in the city even after coming up here. But it's interesting that like a lot of the a lot of the changes in in real estate climate and, and housing and a kind of uh, particular avenue of development that, you know, was taking over downtown New York and Brooklyn is, is also now starting to um trickling up here too <laughs> unsurprisingly so are yeah. you are you up there full time uh were you up there full time before the lockdown or did you go up there for the lockdown i i've been here since the lockdown started yeah um and then in the previous seven years i was um very much back and forth between here and the city and um also of course until lockdown this year was uh, kind of on tour for you know, a hundred plus days a year, each year. So I, I do a lot of, a lot of road time. So I kind of would be between touring and between the city and between Hudson. So, yeah. And so, uh, oh, there we go. Your video's back. Um, so how, um, how are you faring in the lockdown? What are you able to work or do stuff? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, gosh, it's been, uh, it's also been, you know, extremely difficult and challenging as it has been for most of the world. Um, I think especially the musical community and the music industry writ large really took a beating. You know, I had close to 45 concerts canceled in the span of a week in March. So that was pretty insane. Um, and then, of course, as a record producer, you know, I was not able to do much of anything until really the end of the summer. So, you know, it's hard, but... Um, yeah, things have been picking up again nicely, and um, I spend most of the lockdown just gardening and reading and <laughs> playing guitar. So, uh, and I'm happy to be uh, I'm happy to be producing again. We've done a lot of fun sessions now uh, again since since August, and uh, um, of course, very happy to have this new this new record out in the world after many years of work on that. That, that felt good, and actually felt kind of like a nice time to to put that out, you know, I had struggled with kind of philosophically finding a release date for that, given uh, these much larger and ultimately more important things that are going on in the world. But, um, I felt like, uh, now seemed like a good time to contribute something back, you know, and, um, are we talking toxin or dossier? Yeah. Yeah. Toxin. Yeah. Toxin, yeah. 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 Well, toxin is perfect. I was listening to it, the, you know, the morning after election day, and uh, it just reflected, you know, the angstier sections reflected my mood perfectly. I think it's <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's perfect music for for anyone who doesn't just want to zone out with new age stuff, but wants to listen to something that is actually reflecting where we are at the moment. 
Um, oh my God! Yes, I think it definitely speaks to the moment. Uh, um, <laughs> there's just one thing I, I do want to hone in a little. I mean, you're playing yeah. when you say you've got you have a hundred hundred dates because I know people listening or watching are going to want to know you have a hundred dates a year and had 45 dates canceled. Um, are you still there audibly? Oh yeah. Yeah. You, can you, you hear me? Yeah. You froze for a minute. Um, do you have an agent that books this? I mean, how, I mean, I, I'm sure it's easier because you perform solo in some respect, but, but you are performing music that is not pop music. Um, no, no. And there's a lot of pop musicians who are struggling to get that many dates a year. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's also a, it's also a, co a combination of, uh, touring, touring with, with, with your band, touring solo, doing composition work, doing all different types of gigs. And, uh, I also just really love performing. So I, you know, I, I work, work as hard as I can to get out and do it whenever I can do it. And, uh, you know, certainly things, things slow down a lot, but I think like, uh, for, for, for like disease fellas, like uh, one, one thing I also really have always loved about that that band is like, uh, you know, it's a group that also has toured really, really heavily uh, over the last decade. And uh, each of the individuals in the band also have really uh, fledged out solo practices. So um, we're kind of all doing all kinds of things all the time, you know, both. Greg Fox and Sam Hilmer and Michael Bahari and all the other guys who were, were in the band in, in past lineups too, um, are all, you know, constantly doing work with bands and ensembles and as soloists and, uh, really just getting out there and doing it as much as you can, you know, <laughs> well, that seems to but be I the key. Builds, I mean, it, yeah. it, it's the key and it builds, it builds a momentum, I guess is what I mean. And it, and it builds a, and it builds a momentum amongst, uh, amongst your colleagues too. And, and, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess practically to answer your earlier question, like, um, yeah, of course, you know, I, we, we, and I work with, work with booking agents and, uh, you know, as, but it, 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 it that stuff takes, a it just, takes a, a long time to build up the the networks and the, the connections and the people that uh you want to work with to present concerts and uh you know it's definitely it's definitely it continues to be uh, difficult but worth it and you know even of course playing all the time where as you say rightly you know we're not pop musicians so it's not, it's yeah. not well not yeah i mean it's a different it. thing but you're um but it's, it's awesome <laughs> well yeah it sounds like a combination of diversity which everybody has to do these days and and you know hard work um are are is it is it for z's or and or you is it is it mostly club work or is it our concert work or is it are there um are there is it a lot of festival stuff or arts council sponsored stuff or all of the above it's 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 absolutely all of the above so okay. um you know mu music festivals concert halls nightclubs uh um you name it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right